What's up, everyone? This is Anthony Pompliano. Most of you know me as Pomp. You're listening to Off the Chain, simply the best podcast in crypto. Let's kick this thing off. Michael Dunworth is the co-founder of Wire, a company focused on connecting crypto companies to the fiat world. We had a great conversation in this episode about rugby, why nerds go to Silicon Valley, how to build compelling products, and how Wire is building the essential infrastructure for fiat on and off ramps. I really enjoyed this one, so I hope you do as well. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got uh, Michael here. He came all the way to New York City on a day where it's about 18 degrees outside. So uh, thanks for uh, for coming to do this. Yeah, no worries. Still day frosting, but thanks for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> and as you can hear in his voice, he is uh, not used to the cold. <laughs> so we, uh, we're, we're going to get through this. But um, let's uh, let's start with uh, with time in Australia, right? So born, in, uh, born and raised there? Yep, Sydney, Australia. Got it. What's that like? Fantastic. Beaches, not minus eight degrees Celsius. Uh, it's, yeah, it's beautiful. People are chilled, very uh, easygoing, sunny, happy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, growing up, um, you play sports. So like, what, what was kind of the, the life experience in Australia as you grew up? Yeah. You, I mean, rugby and cricket, basically, it's all about it. Uh, I sucked at both and I played <laughs> both. I was in the Fs for rugby. I went to like a full on rugby nursery so to speak like they would produce it was renowned for rugby and stuff like that um but i had no contribution to that at all so what is a rugby nursery oh it's like a breeding ground for like top tier talent basically oh really like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. almost so like, like a prep school yeah exactly it's like a it's a school it's you know uh all catholic boys school basically and um you would go there you get shown like how to play rugby really well i mean it's not a rugby school but they're renowned for producing fantastic rugby players so got it and growing up uh so rugby and cricket both are not very big in the united states obviously we have uh you know baseball and uh football and things like that yep um is like every kid's dream to be a professional rugby player yep exactly so i mean most of the time you grow up sort of like oh i want to you know I think it's changed a little bit now because rugby's sort of got a bit stagnant in like, you know, it's a boring game compared to other games. But um, uh, most people grow up wanting to be a wallaby. Like that's the, you know, the Australian wallabies is like the term for oh. our national rugby team. Oh, got it. Yeah, okay. yeah, so yeah. so they're like that is the team. If you can get on the national Australian rugby team, you yep. are like a god in Australia. Basically, yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, and And... Fun fact, actually, the 5'8", which is a position like, let's say, quarterback, uh, the 5'8 for the U.S. in the World Cup is Australian. Really? Yeah. Or he was actually like, you know, two World Cups ago or one World Cup yep. ago. Yeah. Got it. Mike Herkus. And, and I guess what's interesting about this is uh, things like rugby, cricket, etc. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Right is, is what I understand in terms of it's not just like, a, hey, do you have the skills, but like the physicality specifically of rugby is very similar to uh, American football. That where you Yeah, where you've got to work out a lot and, and it's speed, it's power, it's all this stuff. Uh, and I played American football, you know, all the way through college. I don't understand how these dudes are playing without pads on. <laughs> it's nuts. Okay, so like this is the thing. And I feel like a lot of people have analyzed this a bunch. But when you're playing with pads... I feel like that could actually be more just, I'm just going to throw everything at this person, right? Because they've okay. got pads on. So you're going to be more confident to, you know, there's going to be it. less repercussions. But if I know that I'm going to break my collarbone, like driving it into your, you know, your hip, then I'm going to be more strategic in how I'm going to tackle you or something like that. Oh, so you're making the argument that because there's no pads, it actually might be safer. I would actually say so, yeah. Wow. Huh. I never thought of it that way. Neither uh, had I until I watched someone that was like smart and like talking about concussions yeah. and stuff and he was like actually we did the research and it's like i mean but like nfl is gnarly like people are you know six eight they run a hundred meter dash and you know 11 flat or something it is mental uh i, I uh i just imagine uh somebody like a sean taylor uh who you probably don't know who that is but he's uh he was basically um he played safety so on defense uh, in american football uh, he's the farthest guy back, yep. which means that anything kicker, that happens right? in front of no. him, basically he can run forward and just level them, right? Yep. And so uh, he was notorious for uh, pretty much using almost no uh, technical form in tackling. Kamikaze. He, he just would uh, – we used to call it a torpedo move, right? Basically some guys running across the middle. Yeah. I'm going to launch myself as hard as I can, 
into this person and hope that I dislodge the human from the ball. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and actually, he was really good at it. <laughs> that was um, I don't know if it was Jared. So Jared Hain for he was Hain playing or Hain train or whatever. He was an Australian, uh, you know, NF NRL player, and that's like rugby. It's a different code of rugby. So it's rugby okay. league, rugby union. He came over to play with the 49ers, actually. Um, oh wow! That was like four years ago, I think, uh, okay. maybe five. And he was boiling hot, like buzz everywhere. Everyone was like, "Oh my god, this dude is going to tear it up." He crushed it in like I think like qualifying or preliminary, like the preseason stuff. Yep. Yeah, and I don't actually know what happened in the. He, I think he just but he was it. a rugby player who came to play American football. Yes, that's right. Wow. And uh, he tore it up in the preseason stuff. And mm -hmm. then I think, you know, come like the actual season, he just couldn't uh, couldn't hold up, basically. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I don't it, know what he's doing. It, it's physical, man. Dude, it's, <laughs> man, you guys are crazy. Yeah. Um, all right. So how do you go from uh, rugby nursery to, to – Sucking uh, at rugby, yeah. To uh, – you came to San Francisco in what, 2013? Yeah. What was the uh, the impetus for, uh, for for crossing over that massive ocean to uh, come to the tech capital of the world? Okay, so the easiest, like the too long didn't read, is actors go to Hollywood, nerds go to San Francisco. That's kind of the. That's probably fair. Yeah. So you know, you like you you pack up your bags, a one way trip, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I just wanted like I was like, well, I'm young enough. I'm you know the narrative hasn't kicked in yet. Um, and by narrative, I mean, you know, you get the house, the family, the car, the mortgage, blah, blah, blah. And then life's not life's done, but sort of the opportunity to take chances is, you know, dwindling uh, mm -hmm. exponentially from there. So um, I was working in finance and I did a startup in, uh, in Australia uh, on the side. So it's sort of like you work in you know, finance and that was like 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. And then, you know, you'd hustle after that after hours or you would do like business development in your lunch break and stuff. And um, ended up uh, selling that to a, not like exiting like a you know bazillion dollars, but we made money on it. Um, and that was like a oh fuck, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Sorry for swearing, though. You're okay, you're absolutely allowed yeah. to swear. All right, fuck. Nice. <laughs> like just get it out there. <laughs> fuck you. Um, but you know, like once I did that, I was like, oh my god, that's awesome. But the problem is, like Australia is smaller than California by mm -hmm. population. So mm -hmm. like, if you've really got an itch to scratch, like I want to build something and make people's lives better, like you may as well start with your you know, best foot forward. So you got to roll the dice and you go to the place that has the highest probability of success. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, at the time, San Francisco, I feel like that will change a lot with distributed teams and, you know, things like that. Um, but yeah, for me, that was a no brainer. Um, got it. And, and so when you get to San Francisco, do you have like a plan or was it just let me get there and I'll figure it out once I get there? So I did go with a plan and it was like I'd, I'd had sort of the next idea that I was working on and had like, um, you know, friends that were supporting me uh, with this idea. And so like, you know, they were sort of like, hey, I'll back you into the next idea. Um, but I got I got there and I realized like after grinding for like the first sort of three or four weeks, like I was like, the idea is to get rid of the idea and like, I'm, I'm limiting myself by coming here with pre, like, I don't know what I'm in for. So I better just wipe the slate clean, forget about what I thought I knew and start fresh. And the first person I met, or one of the first, first people was the person on the bunk bed above me. So bunk beds, it was like 20 people. This place was like, it was uh, an orphanage with Wi-Fi is the term <laughs> I would give it basically. Like literally, it was like 25 people in one just hallway. What, it was like a hostel? Uh, I, I wish or that'd be a, a, a friendly it, term it was a 26 year like some 26 year old that's paying the three thousand dollar a month rent and he's subletting it out to you know, 20 people and making 20 grand a month literally those numbers Got um it. yeah and and you get there and what's the the first like, person yeah. okay so i'll tell you about it so like i'm there coming over like oh cool silicon valley like it's where everything happens get there first person i try to open the door to the place that i was staying at and the first person like ran out the door, bumped, I knocked my bag over and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm running to this meeting with Andreessen Horowitz. And I was like, whoa, cool, like I'm here. Like the only thing I read about is like Hacker News and all this sort of stuff. And like, I was like, wow, I really am in the circle jerk now. This is awesome. Yeah. And you know, you get there, there's 20 people on laptops all building shit and you're like, holy shit, all right, this is cool. It was yep. like the show, Silicon Valley. Like they could not have done a better job in depicting it. Um, yeah, the first person I met on the you moved on the top bunk bed above me was uh he's still my co-founder today so really yeah 
Yanni. That's amazing. What's up, Yanni? And and so as um as you're kind of getting settled in and, and you're realizing, hey, this culture is pretty real and uh people here just want to build, etc. Yeah. What were you doing? Were you kind of looking for an idea or kind of what were you doing? Um Yeah, it's a good question. Um I came over with like pretense, like I said, I came over with pretenses, so I was working on that and it was sort of just eating away that that was not the right way to to do this journey or like, you know, to follow up, like to, to execute on what I'd wanted to do, which is try and build something cool. I felt like I was doing myself a disservice. So um, you, what was I doing? I suppose just working away at it, but more just soaking it in. Mm-hmm. And I remember being so like uh, really lonely because it was like, you know, you've one way tick, ticketed yourself and like entrepreneur grinding is really fucking hard anyway and it's it's hard if you don't have people around you that are supporting you or invested mentally in what you're doing day to day and um and i remember like you know calling people calling my friends now like i was like you know i feel like i've made maybe a wrong decision and stuff like that and they were just like no just like soak it up and you know worst case scenario three months goes by you have a bunch of fun you meet a bunch of new people and you've got an experience under your belt best case scenario you come back in 10 years with a really cool story and yeah i feel like it was it was a really hard time at the time but yeah yeah and and part of this i guess is um it feels like a lot of people go to silicon valley and they have a preconceived notion of what they want to do right like yes i'm gonna do x and i think well one of the things I took away when I first got there, um, and I think more, a lot of people do, mm. is uh, a lot of what makes Silicon Valley so uh, powerful and, and beautiful is that the people who get it are the people who realize, no, I'm going to run a bunch of experiments and I'm going to let the results tell me where to go, right? And and that's a yep. very um, nuanced but important difference where uh, this belief that like I'm going to implement my will on the world – uh, is probably not actually uh, nearly as accurate as, hey, I think the world's heading in this direction. Let me go run a bunch of tests, mm-hmm. and I'll take that feedback, and then I'll kind of evaluate again. You know, run a bunch of tests, rinse and evaluate repeat, again, iterate it. Yep. And, and, and that kind of iterative, experimenting yep. uh, type approach gets you much closer to the truth. Um, yep. It gets you much closer to, um, you know, the, the ever elusive product market fit than yep. the. Let me go implement my will on the world and like I'm, I'm right, they're wrong. What idiots? No, I failed because everyone else is stupid. They didn't understand. Yeah, that I think the key thing with that um, is generally speaking, like to be wrong at shit or to be wrong in general, which is what you're sort of saying is someone was saying they're right and everyone else is wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the reality is timing and being right is one of the same. Like that is the the chemistry for execution right Mm -hmm. um and a lot of that comes down to humility Mm -hmm. how good are you at being wrong Mm -hmm. how fast are you at being wrong basically um because you want to be like especially in like obviously digital currencies and bitcoin you want to be wrong really really fucking quickly yeah the pace is so fast it it is um it's an entire uh kind of community of people who understand that that testing and iteration is really important uh and part of what i think has um has really been seared into my brain from from living there and working there etc uh was this idea of we've got to be really good at designing the test so understanding what are we testing why are we testing it and how are we going to test it yep and then executing perfectly like one of the best pieces of uh of kind of um or or one of the best things i took away from my time at facebook was this idea of uh in order to run um successful tests you need to do two things you need Mm -hmm. to measure and you need to execute perfectly right and execute perfectly usually gets left out but what ends up happening is if i run a test and i don't execute it perfectly Mm -hmm. when i get the results if it doesn't work i'm left wondering did this not work because it actually is an invalid test, like like we should move on, it's a bad idea, yep. or did it not work because we didn't execute it perfectly and therefore now we're left and we gotta go run the test again. Of course, and like this is one of the things, so, you know, if, like I suppose like just in, in the premise of me moving to San Francisco, right, and that is me saying I wanna run the test for can I do something really, really cool and build something that adds value to millions of people, mm-hmm. like. I don't know, I'm still on the journey, but like we're figuring it out as we go, right? But that is me saying, 
I don't want to leave any stone unturned so that if I'm 50 or whatever and the story goes by and I'm like, oh, I could have done that. Bullshit, you could have. You didn't do it. But now there's no excuse. So if I don't do it, there was no no excuse other than I couldn't get it done. Mm-hmm. But I tried and I know I absolutely tried with every single ounce of you know energy and opportunity that I could basically. Yep, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and I guess... It's uh, like multivariant testing. Multivariant testing is just numbskull stuff you can never know what the contributing factor was if you have got 30 different things that you change for sure and and so as you're kind of going through this uh evolution and and kind of soaking in silicon valley for all it's Mm -hmm. uh at the time in 2013 uh 13 probably all its glory yeah um where do you eventually intersect with bitcoin blockchain crypto like what's the first time you you hear about it and kind of what was your reaction so i was already into it uh before i came over not in (laughs) Not into it. I was nowhere near into it. I thought it was cool. Uh, you know, friends of mine um, were like going in and bought some bought some together, uh, and I just like chucked in money at the time. And yeah, I think it was yeah that was twenty twelve or twenty thirteen or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so more that, aware of it than actually. Yeah, it was like I was like it. cool. Yeah, sweet. There's this thing. I had no idea what it would do, why it's good, or anything like that. I just had sort of like. YOLO kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, it, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, basically after that, I was like, okay, cool. When we came over here, we were just sort of like, uh, when I came over here, um, I was sort of just intrigued by it because obviously it was going on a massive bull run, right? This is 2013. Uh, we just had Silk Road got closed, I think it was, in 2013. Mm-hmm. And that caused a bit of a you know kerfuffle. And then they had, I think you guys call it the C-SPAN or mm-hmm. whatever the live YouTube stream where they were like, yes, Coinbase is an MSB, but they can still operate. And everyone was like, ah! bull run, basically. And then China goes mental and next thing you know, it's a $1,200 Bitcoin. But getting into it it was actually from like an actual product my co-founder and i were trying to build a one-click checkout on the internet so you go shop on 30 websites you check out enter your payment details once and we were like oh fuck why don't we have bitcoin like bitcoin's kind of cool it's novel and like it could you know get some attention that might help drive awareness we did it and then overnight it was just like the top of bitcoin subreddit and they just did not stop supporting us really and we literally like three days later, we were like, uh, f- fuck, like close the doors. This is a Bitcoin. Like that's all we give a shit about now. Yeah. And literally that was the start of it. And, and so since. it goes back to this idea though, of like you were building a bunch of different things and all of a sudden the data was overwhelming. Hey, there's something here. And you guys saying, let's go focus there and, and kind of don't worry about anything else. Like let's go where uh, people are pulling us into. You, you got to be data driven. Like, yeah. yeah, it's, it's literally, uh, I don't know why you would never ever want to quantify your decisions. If you have the opportunity to, all you're going to do is you're looking for an excuse almost. Mm -hmm. Um, When the excuse not to have an excuse is being shoved right in front of your face, it's da 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 da. -da, Like listen to it. It Mm -hmm. will. It's there to help you. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. No, it makes sense. Um, And so once you guys start focusing on Bitcoin and kind of this one check uh, or one click payment, Mm -hmm. kind of how do you get from that? whoa bitcoin is real and we should focus on it to wire today what, what's that journey look like uh so uh, very iterative basically so like the vision was always you know i we've always been the vision is we don't have a vision and that's like a very fair a fair statement to make because at the time it manages expectations so when you hire people if you hire really talented people when you say we're going to be the leading bitcoin checkout company and then we added, you know, let's say we added five different altcoins. That's not going to sit well with someone that's got a, lead, a lot of conviction, who's a very talented developer that wants to work on Bitcoin being, you know, as big as it can be. Mm-hmm. And so you lose talent and talent retention becomes tricky when you have a vision. So we've always said the space is too early to have a vision. So we just iterated. So started at the checkout and then we thought, well, the next iteration, if you're a checkout, like a browser extension, right? Um, very similar to what Lolly is. Uh, Lolly's really popular. Uh, if we go, the next iteration would be, well, brands, we were saying we would have enough data to see who 
is shopping where we could go to Amazon or go to Zara or go to Newegg and be like, integrate it natively. It's worth it. Here's the dollar value that it's going to return to you guys, mm -hmm. if not the promotional value. And uh, so the next iteration was native merchant checkout. So like a bit pay competitor. And then as you build that, uh, you start realizing that spending only happens when people have made 500x ROI in like 12 months. So you're like, all right, cool. What's next? Uh, a less seasonal version of it is wallets. So people are still going to buy, but in that market, like 2014, 2015, wallets weren't a sustainable business yet mm -hmm. because the you know the ocean wasn't big enough. Now it is big, like it's huge. You've got bear market, bull market. If you are a brokerage service, you're worried about the competitive market saturation more than you're worried about, oh no, it's crypto winter. No one's coming outside to buy Bitcoin or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so- as you iterate on that, uh, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, by the way. No, it does. Um, and, and so I guess really as you're thinking through uh, where do we go, you guys have done a lot of stuff, right? So yep. uh, one of my favorite stories is this idea of the superhero laundry service. Uh, explain what you guys did there, and I think that'll help illustrate – you know, your guys' openness to just trying a bunch of different things and seeing what sticks. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So we did basically, we had writer's block, I suppose it's the equivalent, like where you're sort of just banging your head against the wall, can't can't get past the next milestone. So we stopped, uh, you know, my co-founder and I, and we said, what's the most non this thing we can do right now? Like the complete opposite of what we're doing. And what we did was basically started a laundry hero, like superhero laundry delivery service. So you basically put in an order you say when you want us to pick it up we pick it up 5 a.m in the morning drop it off that night and you pick the super the superhero right so like superman batman superman they're, they're, batman they're and spider-man i think it was uh and so our buddy <laughs> this is so funny our buddy was like oh i shotgun batman and it, it we were like okay sweet everyone wants Batman. Why the fuck would I want to get up at 4.30 in the morning to dress as Batman? And then like, you know, one week later, he's like, getting real tired of this shit, guys. And he's sitting there putting his Batman outfit on. Um, but, but yeah, we did that. And that was awesome because uh, it was completely different. Got a lot of traction because when you show up as Batman at 7 a.m. and a, you know, a five-year-old answers the door ready to go to kindergarten, that five-year-old is now your shill, basically. Your internal referral loop uh, amongst mom and dad to go, you know, why didn't Batman come and pick it up again? And uh, yeah, it was lots of fun. Um, that, that's awesome. And, and really, it sounds like you guys tried it. Hey, it's got a little bit of traction, but uh, might not be the most scalable thing in the world to send people in costumes running around San Francisco picking up laundry. Yeah, we made, we made a decision sort of like, it would, it would either go the direction of like, oh, is this going to become like Lyft or Uber, where you open it up and you see different neighborhoods where it's like heroes and villains and you see little like hero and villain icons, sort of like, which one do you want to pick up your laundry kind of thing? Um, but that would be sort of giving it a nudge. And I felt like there's better things in the world to do than another laundry delivery service, which is, you know, catering to us lazy, fortunate people that are being, you know, focused on convenience and not adding value. For sure. And so as you... We're building wire, right? And, and yeah. understanding that Bitcoin itself, I think a lot of the um, kind of testing and, and uh, the open mindedness to try new things, mm -hmm. it seems like you guys have found a very specific niche in helping people go from fiat currency to uh, crypto and uh, all of the technical rails and, and kind of infrastructure that's needed, but mm -hmm. also on the licensing front. Maybe describe uh, what you guys are doing today, and then we can go through kind of the work that's gone into uh, to get to this point. Yeah, yeah, So basically, um, you know, fiat to crypto, you know, when you put your card down, you make a payment, you get Bitcoin in your wallet. Uh, that's really hard to do. And there's a reason why it's such a pain in the ass for everyone to go buy crypto. Like, you know, you go sign up at Coinbase or anywhere, most of the time you're gonna go blood sample, stroke of your hair, you star sign, shirt off your back, selfie, everything. That is all because uh, they need to do that because of the risk and compliance association with doing it. And so as everyone's going through this, ourselves included, we realized, to build our company, we had to actually get all these same licenses and MSB and all this, all this knowledge that's just like a, you know, it's a vo a big uh, vacuum of resources, time, energy, and uh, capital. And so when we did it, we were like, oh, I mean, fuck, everyone's gonna do this, no chance. Yep. 
we should productize this. This is our journey. So, you know, some people grow up and it's like, oh, I lived in a country and we couldn't send money internationally. So I moved and started Western Union and that's their pain point they solved and bravo. And that's fantastic. I was very fortunate. I didn't have that pain point. The pain point I had was I was trying to build a fintech company and I was just getting slaughtered at every angle, trying to get it done. Not trying to side skirt, like trying to play ball, but it's like, you got to have a lot of money to play ball. And so as we did it, we, you know, over the years we'd iterated, we're like, fuck, we've got to just give this to people so that the whole industry can move fast enough mm -hmm. because the window of opportunity we have for like digital currencies to be as impactful as they can be is finite. Mm -hmm. um, the big don't eat the small, the quick eat the slow. And yep. that's... Wait, say that again? The big don't eat the small, the quick eat the slow. That's... That, what, that's a really good saying. I never heard that before. The big don't eat the small. The, the quick, quick eat, eat the, the slow. slow. That's right. That's one of the things is like try and well, I feel like I beat a beating a dead horse. Not a beating a dead horse, banging the drum. But we always say that at work. Like I mean, not at work because it's not. It never feels like work. Why would I ever <laughs> call it work? Uh, but you know, like in the office, it's like a, a mentality. We we're very sort of like if you ask people that work there. Um, I feel like they'd say that. That's yeah. definitely one of them. So there's a uh, there's an Instagram account that uh, you just made me think of. It's called Nature is Metal. Dude, that's so funny. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. All right. So uh, I follow What's it. your favorite? Like, you, uh, did you see the shark crocodile one? Uh, I've seen a lot of them. Uh, Nature is Metal. Like, that is the best description of it. So, yep. All right. So just so people understand, there's an Instagram account. It's at Nature is Metal. And what it basically does is it takes photos or videos from... Uh, just hardcore wildlife. So you can get on there. Next thing you know, you see uh, a lion eating an alligator or you see um, a snake that has the two feet of a rabbit, you know, uh, right before it swallows it. I mean, just it, it's really gruesome and it's really uh, it's raw. Like yeah, it's raw. just like, you know what? It's not national. Like that's the real National Geographic. This is hunt or be hunted. This yes. is the food chain. This is how you know, the world works kind of thing. So it, it is, uh, it's a type of account that you follow when you want a daily or multi multiple times a day reminder of, uh, th there's this uh, saying I see people post all over Instagram. That's, uh, this life is a hundred percent on you. No one's coming to save you. Right. Yeah. Like that's essentially what nature is. And, and the yep. part that I like about, uh, this account is, um, yeah, they've got the, the crazy, uh, I saw a video there the other day where, um, Basically, a lion was running and, or a leopard or something, right? And it caught like an antelope. Yeah. And it's just, you know, again, the, the quick eat, the slow and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the ones that get me are uh, the ones that are really gruesome where you see the, you know, the panther after it's eaten the prey. Uh, and it's just Savage. blood everywhere. Yep. And you look at it and you're just like, that is the animalistic nature, right? It's yep. just it needed to eat had to like and so what did it do it killed to eat exactly that's what it has to do to survive end of story it's not emotional in anything like that it is fight or flight uh, yeah that's yeah and, and so to me um you know i know it's a little bit of sidetrack but uh it's one of those accounts that uh it's a, a mentality thing it's really interesting to uh to see so if, uh, everyone go check out uh, at nature is metal um, I, I should get whoever runs that account to come on. I, oh, I think yeah. Be super, 100%. Super interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but I do think... What was think, the quote that they said? It was like, everything's on you? Uh, so, well, or I've seen different like variations that? of it. Basically, uh, this life is 100% your responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yep. No one's coming to save you. True. It's so true. Like, And you know what's <laughs> funny? Like, I remember um, it, it, before, like when I was young, I had to write out a thousand lines, which is, you know, you do something, you fuck up in school, and you got to do it. And I remember a trying... Thousand? A thousand? Dude, oh man, man. Australia is tough. Yeah, the US Jesus. is like, hey, write fifty and go take a go they, take a they, dessert break. Yeah, <laughs> right. They caught wind of those, you know, ten pens attached to each other, so they <laughs> pushed it up from a hundred to a thousand. But it said, uh, "Whatever it is to be is up to me." And that, whatever it is to be is up to me. And All it's right. yeah, this is not a dress rehearsal. This is this is, this is it. Yeah. You know, and uh, like it, lump it, hate it, love it, whatever it is. You just got to manage your own expectations and realize that's the case. Uh, yeah. You're going to fuck up. You're going to drop the ball. Like, w like I wouldn't say we, but I definitely know myself. Uh, and as a company, like, we're really good at being 
really shit at stuff and that's that's a fantastic <laughs> attribute especially in a fast moving industry the faster you can be like oh man i look like shit in the mirror today or not that that's how we're judging the company but you know they say a friend tells you you look good your best friend tells you you look like shit yep. if you look like shit yep. um and i feel like we're very good as a team and as individuals on the team uh because everyone is so bright and this industry is full of really brilliant people but if you're not humble enough to iterate on your own opinions, you want to be discovering, you don't want to be right. You want to get the right answer. What, you know what, what I mean? What do you do when you identify that you're bad at something? Uh, usually take too long to make the decision to cut the arm off or whatever it is. Um, you know, obviously you want to make that decision as fast as possible, but uh, yeah, you, you just sort of, you make a change. You identify the... But do you bring in somebody who's good at it? Do you try to get better at it? Well, like, you can't, what do you do? Well, I mean, firstly, you have to identify it, right? So you, you can't fix anything until you identify that it is a problem. And I think uh, identifying a problem as a team, it's not about oh, just doing someone a favor to say, okay, well, we'll cater to your opinion. It's like, no, 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 guys, we've all got to see this. Is this a problem? Can we move forward successfully? In the long term, short term, eh, maybe, you know, don't do, don't fix something because I'm asking. Let's understand why it is a problem because then, you know, you're infinitely going to grow in alignment if that's the case. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing me a favor, it's not going to be a long term successful opportunity. Yeah. And I think this goes back to part of Silicon Valley's uh, beauty is people are ruthlessly honest. Yeah. Right. And in well, most parts ish. of the world. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Explain. Why do you well, say Well, I mean. I uh, like I actually don't think that I would say it's sort of people are very especially in the entrepreneur world right if you're an entrepreneur um, or I'm an entrepreneur I go to you I'm like hey I want to raise capital here's my idea now you rely on deal flow as an investor and you don't want me to be saying you want me to be evangelizing our conversation that we have and so you don't want to say your idea sucks here's why bang 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 because so many people are carrying their dreams to you to make them happen with you know capital raising and personally tell it like shoot it straight that's fine because now i can iterate i just want the right answer mm -hmm. but a lot of people are going to be like i can't believe he said that to me like he doesn't like me like how it, it's like he wants to make an investment and he wants to make like you are doing them a favor shooting them straight but you're risking them bitching about you to their friends yeah, they, and their network and now your deal flow tightens up well the you, downside could be hey he's an asshole right but but, but I you're think not that, being an asshole shooting it straight this person if you really want to be like the spinach and the teeth thing oh he's yeah. being an asshole tell me he has spinach there. no he is trying to save you time, time. Yep. time is the most valuable asset on the entire planet we all get the exact same amount of it it's who uh, realizes that you know it is most valuable. You can't yeah. like you can't earn time. You can save it or you can spend it. You cannot earn it. So you're never going to get more of it. So you can use it wisely. I feel like that's a pretty good saying. H have you ever seen uh, the movie with Justin Timberlake uh, in time? Trash. And I'm oh, a trash you don't like it. I've never even seen it. No, oh. Is that the one where he's got like the yes. the things on his arm or whatever? Yeah, so, it's like so for those uh, that have never seen the movie, basically. Uh, Every human has a clock or like a yeah. countdown clock on their uh, forearm and uh, you go to work, you yeah. get paid yeah. in time. So literally mm. time is the unit is the currency. Yep. And so let's say you go to work today and you get another 24 hours, right? We well, got to come back to work tomorrow to get 24 more hours. Yeah. Uh, but if at any point you run out of time, mm -hmm. you die. Now, if you are rich, you end up having... On, time like infinite outsourcing time, it right no you just have infinite infinite amount of time so you end up with ah. let's say that uh you know a hundred centuries worth of time or a hundred yeah, yeah, years yeah, yeah. right or 50 years worth of time or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. uh and then if you are poor you are usually living with less than 24 hours in the movie yep and so you know quote unquote poor meaning hey you don't have a lot of time yep so what ends up happening in the movie is the people who don't have a lot of time yep. they run everywhere Right, so they're literally sprinting because they don't have a lot of time. Ah, and the only way to get more time is to go to work. So they're literally trading labor for quote time. Right, so there's yes. kind of all these metaphors of real life. Yeah, but the wealthy, when that you go to the wealth zones, yeah, these are people who have a lot of time. You can't go in between these wealth zones without 
certain thresholds of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like every, tiers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you have, let's say, more than 20 years of time, then yep. you're allowed into you know the wealthiest zone. The president's club, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And nobody runs there. Actually, running is a sign of not having any, quote unquote, money or time. Yes. Because why are you in a rush? Oh, you yeah. must not have a lot of time. Yep. Right. And so the reason why I like the movie is. Uh, I really of, like the premise of this, by the way. Yeah. It's, Sorry, it's, Justin Timberlake. <laughs> it's the parallels to life of what are we all actually optimizing for? Right. We say yes. it's money. We say it's all stuff. But at the end of the day, it's time. Right. And, yep. and time ends up being really, really important. And what I think a lot of people don't do is they don't put a monetary value on their time, right? And it's one of the easiest things that I tell young people to do, which is yep. decide how much your time is worth to you, mm -hmm. right? How much would you pay to get an hour of time? Yep. Is it $5? Is it $100? Is it $1,000? What, what is that? Yeah. And also, what are you willing to get paid in exchange for your time, right? Yes. And so when you come up with those two numbers, hopefully – those two numbers match. Yeah. <laughs> in some cases, they they don't match. Yeah. But when you come up with those numbers, now all of a sudden, the decisions of what you do with your time become super, super clear. Absolutely. This is this is mind blowing. Actually, that you're saying this. Um, I won. I could not agree more. And it, it, I think it becomes time is that's the currency. I mean, that's the the measurement for everyone, right? But what people get paid in determines what's valuable to them and what they prioritize. So if you give me money uh, for my time, or like, let's say I go, hey, I really want an hour of your time. And you're like, okay, cool. I want you, and like you might say, all right, I want a thousand bucks. And that quantifies out to your, your hourly rate. Or you might say, there's actually, you can give me more than money. You can put uh, five hours of your time onto this problem I'm trying to solve. And that is more valuable than a thousand bucks. Yep. Um, it's fascinating. Well, and, and the education or information may give you more time later. So I'll yes. give you an hour today that's mm -hmm. worth X dollars, but it's because that hour of time today is going to save me 50 hours of time later. 100%. Right? And so what do we call that when it's capital? Investment. Yep. Right? I'll invest an hour with you today because you're going to give me something that later is going to pay off 50x what I invested. Yes. Right? And when you start thinking of your time that way, mm -hmm. as if it's capital, I think people start changing what they do. Yeah. Right? I remember my old boss at, uh, at work, he was like, hey, you've been doing the same thing for like four hours. And I had to do this really like repetitive process, uh, you know, 280 times or something to go through some updates or something. This is like years ago. And I spent five hours and I hadn't done one of them. Okay. And it was the case of I'm really lazy. So like as a person, I'm extremely lazy. So... I will always be like, oh, what's the you know, what's the catch here? There's got to be an easier way. And that was me spending like five hours so that it's automated so that I don't have to do it again. And then yeah, he was stoked with that because now no one else in the future has to do it either. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it, everything, especially in investing, right, for you, like, oh, is it a good investment? Is it a bad investment? Well, what's your time horizon? Is Bitcoin a good investment long, long term? Uh Absolutely. Is it a good investment today? Yeah, I don't know. Flip a coin. Like mm -hmm. I I everything is relative because the value is going to be relative. Like value is in the eye of the beholder, right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If I've never eaten a, uh, I haven't eaten in three weeks and you bring me an old cheeseburger, I'm going to be like, oh my God, thank you. But if I just had dinner and I've had like beautiful dinner, I'll be like, get that shit out of here. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, Everything is relative, so adding value to anything is always going to be relative. For sure. So well, one, like, one of the things that yeah. uh, somebody, uh, I think it was Naval, recently tweeted, he said, uh, earn with your mind, not with your time. Uh, yeah. Usually, I'm too stupid to get his tweets, so it takes me like 30 <laughs> reads, but <laughs> yes, I, I see you. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so the whole idea is just the value you create is much more the intellectual value you provide right. than the like manual uh, or, brute force or, kind of yeah or just yeah. your time right yeah so if you spend an hour doing something and it, I spend two minutes doing something yeah uh, and I get paid more than you get paid yeah does that make me lazy does that make me smarter does that make me just understand the rules of the game better yeah right all these different things but yeah. I think that 
that was a really uh, powerful way to, to kind of articulate some of these ideas of just like earn with your mind, not with your time. Yep. Uh, and that changes, again, behavior because people begin optimizing for something differently. What are we all optimizing for right now? I mean, look, we're in a beautiful office, 54th floor. Everyone is, everyone is chasing. They're chasing something. And I had this conversation at this hacker house in uh, Tribeca. Yes, I think it's Tri- Tribeca. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a place. Yeah. yeah, that's a place you uneducated idiot. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I had. This I don't know if that's where you were, but that's definitely <laughs> a place in New York. <laughs> okay, right, right, right. Um, but like, having this, what are we all doing? Like, literally, where, where, why are we going to work? Well, we're going to work to make money. Why are we making money? Oh, so we can pay the rent. Why is the rent? Oh, because they want to make money because they've got an investment. Like, it all just and you know it says Bitcoin solves this. Dude, like, I mean, as philosophical as you want to get, call it bullshit, call it not bullshit. The reality is, like, it does at the end of the day. If mm-hmm. Imagine if, let's vaporize money out of the conversation. What do humans do day in, day out? They be themselves. Mm-hmm. What is the, your superpower, like as Pomp, right? Nobody can be you but you. That is your superpower that you give to the rest of the world. No, you are that. And your originality is what humans as people, at least this is sort of, you get kind of philosophical and shit, but I mean, dude, I'm down the rabbit hole here for six years, 10 years in Bitcoin. So give me a break. Uh, uh, but the reality is if money is coming just super easily, uh, then what do you do? And it's sort of like you try and think about people. Well, I look at the people on X Factor or, you know, American Idol or whatever, you know, you get the 70 year old or the 60 year old woman that sings and blows everyone's mind. Why does people like that? They like it because one, it's original and they never saw it coming. So that originality sparks a fire in us. And the second part is that they ask the story, oh, what happened? Oh, well, you know, uh, I ended up, you know, uh, falling out with my parents when I was young and then I lived on the street and then I just had to meet, make ends meet and I got an office job and life got in the way. Life got in the way of that. And that could have been Picasso, Columbus, or whoever everyone celebrates. But that is the problem. And life getting in the way is not, oh, there was just too many people being themselves. It's the rent was high, the bills got to get paid, da 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 da. And so, like, I feel like it's sort of a great thing when you think about Bitcoin solves this. I mean, Bitcoin is the first thing that looks like a opportunity at money vaporizing. Uh, I mean, like, look, it's hard money. It's absolutely but it's sort of going to be to the point where it makes it not a thing anymore yep. um and, and and i guess part of this uh really comes down to we are asking people to be experts at multiple things right and i've talked about this before but i want you to earn a living mm-hmm. being everything from a teacher to a fireman to a finance professional to an accountant to you know, a marketer, wh- whatever your job is. Yep. And then I want you to be a professional investor to protect your wealth, right? I need you to do that because inflation is going to steal your wealth if you don't. Yep. And so you have to understand asset classes, portfolio construction, right? all these different things. Mm-hmm. And if you do not understand those, but you still want to protect your wealth, then you need to pay somebody to protect your wealth for yes. you, right? And it's all because systematically you are incentivized to get out of cash, right? Yep. Now, that is uh, a pretty big problem. When you add in this layer of uh, machines and automation and all this stuff, right? Yep. People start to worry about, uh, are they gonna lose that income, right? Yep. Uh, and one of the things that drives me, I think, uh, to, to share this with people because it seems so obvious, but, but maybe mm. it's not, is that in a world where automation and machines become so prevalent and pervasive, creativity is the one thing that the machines are going to kind of automate last, right? It's the, it's what, the human uh, ingenuity. And, and if you can optimize for a job or making a living, leveraging creativity and human ingenuity, you got a pretty good shot of surviving the automation wave. <laughs> you are the last person. I, Yes, a trillion percent agree. And this is where it's going because – the light, like if we think about machines, right? And I, I'm in like investment groups, very intelligent people that dismiss this premise. And they say it's far too early. I'm like, look, if you look at it properly, Bitcoin is the carrot and, uh, you know, like that experiment with monkeys, right? 
the scientist, he's got bananas and there's monkeys, 10 monkeys lined up. They go, I want a banana. They grab a banana. The banana is thrown into a room and the door closed behind them. The monkey is caged. So the monkey wanted a banana, but now the monkey's in a cage and it doesn't have its own ability to do whatever it wants or whatever. So it's caged in. Now it does not want a banana. It wants to be itself again. It wants to like, just let me out of the cage. Take the next 20 bananas. Don't give them to me. That is, if we look at history, we were formerly, like before us now, which is like intelligent beings or whatever, uh, ex- other than you and I. Um, but basically, it was, you know, cavemen or whatever. We didn't have our brains firing as well as they are. Uh, basically, the next iteration, we're in the middle right now between intelligent, like, you know, intel- cavemen and super intelligence, which is computers. So if you're a computer, right, imagine, imagine AI and 30 years from now and you look back at a capitalist America and society money hungry ads 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 buy 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 what do you think the carrot is or the banana to get us into locked in the cage it's going to be money mm-hmm. right so that's of the course. banana so people think we're you know de-shackling ourselves from governments but I mean there's a very very clear path that that could become we're actually handing over the keys from the government uh, to ourselves, but it's actually not ourselves. It's machines controlling our money. Well, uh, and, and I always go back to this idea of um, creativity is mispriced, right? Uh, and, and creativity being yes. mispriced is the fact that it's going to actually appreciate in value over time. Yep. People don't yet understand that. And so therefore they put a lower price on that creativity uh, and so if it's an underpriced asset or mispriced asset, yep. uh, investing there today will pay off pretty well in the future. Yep. Um, and if you think about where the machines and automation are going to come in, actually the people who can leverage creativity and kind of uh, human intelligence and ingenuity the best, the automation is only going to further the moat for those who are in the creative business. Literally, the only thing right now, like you can train data sets for, you know, yes or no questions. Is that a flower? Yes or no, whatever. Write me a poem, stuff like that. You know, if you look at how this how this goes, if we've got machines that can do everything for us, everyone's going to be like, oh, I want a day in the life of Drake, or I want to do this, or I want to do that. I want to be this person. Everyone starts shaping themselves towards being the same almost. And what's left after everyone's sort of been Drake for a day and they've been everyone, they're like, okay, what's next? Originality is it. That is the, that is the key ingredient that is going to be the most important commodity of the future is originality. And right now money squandered, like money gets in the way of that. So like the singer, the artist, it was like, oh, life got in the way and I couldn't share my voice with the world. That voice could be an opinion. That voice could be Mozart or whatever, who else has crushed it in the past. But like you do a history test, they're not saying, "Hey, uh, you know, what was Drake's first album on?" Da-da. No, it was who was the first person to write this? Who was the first person to discover that? Who went to the moon first? Da, 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 da. They don't remember second, third, fourth. They remember the first, and that's because it is original and it is new. And our brains—that's why humans evolve the way we do—is because eh, what's behind the curtain? We're always looking for shit, and that evolution of asking asking why and that iterative process that's that's literally how we evolve and so like having the mindset that being knowing that first or like no managing your own expectations whether it's in life or com- running a company or anything like that when you know things are going to change that's okay and it doesn't mean you're right or wrong you can just always like a saying we're like you know on our team is always plan for the worst hope for the best mm-hmm. End of the day. And some people come back like investors. They're like, well, that's a really negative outlook. I'm like, no, that's not a negative outlook. That's a very realistic outlook. Mm -hmm. Statistically probable, like, and the odds of us being wrong. Yeah, let's plan for the worst. What's the worst case doomsday scenario? If we've got a playbook for it, then everything else is cream. Like, yeah, th- this goes back to um, so there's a very fa- sorry for the rant by the fa- way. No, 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 no. You're, you're, uh, you're you're dead on. There, there's a very famous um, approach that uh, Nick Saban, uh, the coach at Alabama, uh, and a few other professional coaches have uh, ha- have kind of um, solidified or, or made famous, mm-hmm. which is uh, focus on the process, right, and do your job. And so in football, for example, mm-hmm. there's 11 uh, folks on the field. Yeah. And uh, on offense, right, yeah. when you have the ball, every play is drawn up to be a touchdown. 
<laughs> right? I've never I've never <laughs> seen a play drawn. Literally, you mean where that, like the arrows and all the X's and circles? all that stuff? It's a touchdown. I think you're mad in '95. Yeah. Or, you know, they score yeah. every single time on the chalkboard, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason why that doesn't happen in real life is because one of those eleven folks, yep, doesn't do what they're supposed to do, yep. right? So the example I always give is. The quarterback's job on, you know, the play we're about to run is to take the snap, take three steps, and yep. hand the ball to the running back, yep. right? The guy who snaps the ball, his job is to snap the ball, take two steps, you know, to his right, post his right arm, lock in yeah. the guy in front of him, and then turn and, and block anybody who comes off the backside, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Then the running back's job is to step to the right, run upfield, take the ball, run through the hole, blah, 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 whatever. And every single one of those people has a job. Now, the whole thought process behind do your job is if you're the center, the guy snapping the ball, yeah. don't worry about if the quarterback's handing the ball off or not. Make sure that you snap the ball, you take two steps to the right, you There's post no your right arm, in that et cetera. At all. Right? Yeah, it's just <laughs> do your job, and yep. if all 11 people on the field do their job on this play, yep. we're going to score a touchdown. Right? <laughs> that is mind-blowing. I didn't realize it was so non – like, that seems oh, – I mean, it uh, makes sense, sorry. Go for broke, obviously. But, I mean – and that can happen in football, obviously, because you can get that 60-yard throw or whatever it is. But I feel like... Uh, Every play. No, it's not just the 60-yard touchdowns. This is the key piece of where this, where Surely this goes Surely there's to... more strategic ways to be like, let's march up the field to start with and well, then go for broke when we're closer. Like, Well, so it's not going for broke, though, right? This is the big secret, and I think there's a lot of yeah, correlations yeah, yeah. to business. So the whole idea here is don't worry about scoring, yeah. right? If you're the center, don't worry if we score or not. All you need to worry about is something very simple. Snap the ball, take two steps to the right, post with your right arm, hinge, and make sure you get anyone off the backside. Yes. Right? And if that's all you got to worry about. You don't have to worry about what play we've run. You don't have to worry about who's in the game. You don't mm-hmm. have to worry what the score is. You don't have to worry if we score or not. Yep. All of that stuff is a distraction. Yep. Just do your job on this one play. Yep. Focus right now on your job and do your job. Yep. By the way, if you trust that the other 10 guys on the field each do their job on this play, we end up scoring. Uh, well, yeah. So I, I see you. I think that's interesting. But if I was a football coach, I would say, well, the whole, those 11 people at the time, they're all looking at the coach or the manager, whoever it is and saying, I trust that you are absolutely certain that you have accounted for every permutation of what's, what out, what they're going to throw at us, because that is what's going to cause me to not do my job successfully, which is going to unbundle all of it as a house of cards. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of uh, inch by inch, life is a cinch, yard by yard, life is hard. Have you heard that saying? No, what is that? Well, it means one step at a time. Like, you know, you inch don't... by inch, life is a cinch, yard, yard by, by yard, yard, life is hard. So like, <laughs> as in one step at a time, it all fall into place. So that's sort of like, you know, if you want to go for a touchdown, yeah, like, sure, you can go for it. Probably not going to be as successful. It's sort of like, oh, how... It takes years to become an overnight success. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, Uber! Everyone's I could I could have built Instagram and sold it for a billion dollars. No, you couldn't have because you didn't know all the iterations that they went through. They started as a bourbon photo app or something mm-hmm. like that. That iterative process, but that was their inches, like one step at a time. They mm-hmm. didn't go it, like look at the evolution of the internet, right? People used to knock on neighbors' doors and be like, "Hey, morning, have you picked up the paper?" Imagine if I came to you in 1990 with the internet and I go, "Hey." uh, Upload all pictures of yourself. Tell me when you got uh, engaged. Congratulations, by the way. Um, tell me about you getting engaged. Uh, where'd you go on holidays? I want to see photos. And you're going to share these with strangers that you've never met before. You'd be like, what the fuck? No. But it crept up to where it is today. And we look back and we're a long way from Kansas kind of thing. But at the time, it's just, oh, just like, you know, your bedroom is like, you've got Metallica posters. Yeah, make your own website. That's kind of like your digital bedroom. And then it's, mm-hmm. oh, tell us what you're thinking. And that's your your consciousness stream of Twitter or whatever. Um, show me where you are. What are you doing? And then you look and you're like, holy fuck, I'm right there with everyone. So the world gets really small really quickly because you feel like you're in your neighbor's house automatically. So, um, but if I said that to you at the start, you would not have bought into it. It mm-hmm. wouldn't uh, create success. Uh, Instagram wouldn't be popular if it came out day one of the internet. People would feel like it's invasive. Mm-hmm. And so to change behavior, which is typically what most companies that have a huge breakthrough are trying to do, or let's say technology like Bitcoin, it is iterative. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know that doesn't mean that you should, it's zero, 100 is wrong, but 
both things can get there in the end. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be kind of, you know, it'll figure a way out. It's just, do you want it to take six years or do you want it to take 15 or 20 years? Um, and that's sort of like a premise, even if I am like, let's say a Bitcoin bull, and I think Bitcoin's going to, you know, vacuum in a lot of the value that we see today. Is it a bad thing to have 40 different alternatives that are trying to throw shit at the wall and iterate? And Bitcoin can sort of see that and adopt that over time. Like, is that gateway drug mentality the right answer? Or is it, no, it is it or get out of the way? What do you think? Um, well, I think yeah, I go back and forth with buddies around this. But I think, look, at the end of the day... The downside to gateway drug mentality is, I mean, the, the upside is that, you know, um, you get to see and learn and adopt it if you are Bitcoin or if you are you know, the biggest in the room. Um, but the downside is obviously there's a lot of people that get, can get hurt from that. So there's a lot of scammers and stuff like that, which it, it feels like, oh, that person's never going to trust cryptocurrencies again because it's given its bad name, da, da, da. They're coming back. Like every bull run, you see your friend, you know, everyone's got those tweets or those direct messages where they told their friends to buy a Bitcoin in 2013 or 2011 or whatever it was. And they said no, then they don't miss it the second time. And so that's the, you know, the mob comes. They're coming either way, uh, whether we like it, whether we don't, uh, whether you're a government, whether you're the poorest person on the planet, it is happening. You can just choose to take a risk earlier or later mm -hmm. and people are usually rewarded for their risk but the funny thing is is the earlier people get into it it typically is indicative of their principles as well like a lot of the people when satoshi makes bitcoin right um funny thing craig uh right uh, <laughs> who, who? <laughs> craig right he was uh i think he was actually a lecturer at the university i went to uh in australia which is funny um just kidding no, I actually i think he was but i wasn't there then um the when Satoshi makes it, Satoshi has a choice to go, holy shit, I've just invented irreversible digital money. That solves porn, gambling, and every high-risk industry. But is that the best way for the network to evolve in a hard way? No, it's to go to really brilliant cryptographers and say, hey, I need your eyes on this. What are we missing? Like, let's work, let's harden the base. And so, like, if you look at teams like doing token sales and stuff, you go list on Binance, that's a great payday. And I think Binance is awesome for like, if you're a trader and stuff like that. But you know, if you've got some sort of thing that you're trying to control, it's, you're trying to nurture, like raising a child, that's what a, like a distributed network of cells is what raising a child would be. And networks are like biology really. So you want to nurture it so it grows in the most optimal direction for the core principle that it was founded to be. Now, if I find it to be a scam coin or anything like that, I grow it to be a scam coin. But if I'm really trying to solve a problem or like hard money, that I want to nurture it for the long term and not take the poison apples, which might be, you know, short short term self interest. Sorry for the how, rant. How do you guys think about that at Wire, right? So so like who are the types of customers that you guys are trying to work with? Um so I mean Predominantly, it's developers, uh, you know, fintech teams, brokerages. Uh, it's people who need the infrastructure. It's people that need the infrastructure. Yeah. So a lot of like exchanges, wallets, things like that. Um, yeah, we want to get to as many people as possible because, you know, we we just want people to realize, like, just don't bother with doing it all again. Don't go get the banking relationship. Like, this is a many hands make light work situation. If we all work together, we band together as one, which is we take care of, you know, everyone bites off a piece of expertise. Like we we're talking about with people and their personalities, like creativity or what are you an expert at that I can extract value from and in return give you value. Um, and those are sort of harmonious relationships. But if you look at banks now or neobanks, right? So you look at a neobank, it is a cosmetic layer over the best of stock trading the best of this banking service the best of international transfers and they bundle it all together to look like a bank and they present it much better and banks are you know construction of five different products lending saving borrowing whatever um neobanks are like that but they pick the best of each you know if we look at how we can build the future of you know uh, digital assets and digitizing money generally speaking you know bitcoin bites off 
one of those pieces uh most likely though everything will rely on it because Mm. if you look at a digital world with computers computers have never had a unified clock let's call it Mm. as simple as that like we look at the sun the sun goes round and round that is the source of energy that provides us with coordination at scale um a clock is the same thing for machines uh the bitcoin block height sorry so regardless it's not about whether I like Bitcoin more than I like Ethereum or anything like that. Bitcoin is the longest running track record. So if I'm telling and, you and the sun's the, wrong... And determine the most valuable by the market. Of course. It, but it, it's the problem it solves is what value does Bitcoin add? Oh, it's not fast enough. It's, 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 the only thing it has to do is not change. Imagine if the sun fell out of the sky and we're like, oh, shit, we were wrong. Actually, there's four suns. Whoops. You'd be like, Huh? No, the sun is the sun because we know that that thing's been there the longest thing since the beginning of time. It's going to turn on tomorrow, man. What? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's going to turn on, man. He's got a good work ethic, this sun. Um, but do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's just being respectful of that. That is, that's the fact. Call it how you see it. You guys raised money during the depths of the bear market. What was that like? Um, I have an exceptionally, like I said earlier, I was terrible at a lot of things. Raising money is one of them. Um, but I think like the most interesting takeaway when we raise money was definitely managing expectations. So, um, you know, in bull markets and bear markets and stuff like that, you have obviously peaks and troughs. uh, And when you have such seasonal, like financial markets are seasonal, especially financial markets in a newly adopted technology. So to say, oh, we're gonna grow 20% month over month, you just know you are not because you have not quantified every single contributing factor to be able to determine that at all. So um, managing expectations was the best part about that, where I said to our investors, I said, look, we are going to make less money than we did this year. Unfortunately, I mean, sorry, like that was the premise. The focus was on the core way to determine whether or not we have done our job is our KPIs on distribution. How is our reach going? Because, and it's not like, let's just get a bunch of users and monetize later, but it's like, it truly is. These are networks. Networks operate on connectivity and distribution and tying things together to create resiliency. Like that's how a network is, survives. It's flat, but it, everything's connected and that, that's its resiliency. And so distribution is like our focus because the tech is there and there's brilliant people that are more focused on it, more obsessed with that specific component of it. Like. Let, let them be masters at it. And then mm. that's better for us to t- have a conversation with them about, hey, how can we take advantage of that? Or how can we add value to you guys building this tech and vice versa? So like, you know, w- whatever that tech is, I mean, like whether that's, uh, yeah, there's a million and one things it could be, but I think it's, yeah, I think that's just the way that you've got to play the game. And a lot of people, I think the default setting in finance, generally speaking, or anytime there's money involved, self-interest. Mm-hmm. Self-interest, self-interest, self-interest. What does it look like long-term when you are not a company living quarter to quarter and you are sacrificing self-interest for what could be the greater piece of the pie? Like, is it in our best interest as a company to make our company stock worth more or is it in our best interest to buy a significant amount of bitcoin and grow the pie more what Mm. is going to be long-term more sustainable what's going to add more value what's going to get there faster i'm not saying i've just bought bags of bags of bitcoin by the way but i mean like it's it's a thought process i mean Mm. that is a very legitimate approach and some some teams that are very successful in the space they actually have that approach. Um, it's a good redundancy. If you're betting on the space, as a, if you're a company and you're committing your whole life to this space, I mean, you may as well load up your bags while you're on the plane kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge in the industry right now? Identifying what adds value and what doesn't add value. Explain that. Nobody focuses on adding value. I mean, sorry, not nobody. Very few do. Mm-hmm. What adds value? So I'll give you like... So I have a very big belief that uh, if, what browser do you use on your computer? Uh, I use a couple, but Chrome mostly. mostly. Nice, nice. Um, so I was just curious, actually. But like Opera <laughs> browser, <laughs> how much do you make after Joe, tax you think that's on an funny annual? over there? Jo- Joe's laughing. Somebody came yeah. in and just asked me some random questions. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, Got my social security Joe's number next. Joe's laughing because he's spying through your camera because of Chrome. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, but like, so Opera browser, right? 
Opera browser is three to four or five percent. Like it's one of the. It's I think it's in the top five browsers on like on the planet. They have 350, 400 million users. Now that is something that is really interesting to me because that penetration is on a different side of the world. So mm-hmm. if you have that and every person on a device with a browser that can extract value from this like you know what is adding value is it me like talking about adding value do we create a product that gives a five percent savings uh to people or borrowing money at 20 percent interest rates or whatever like whatever's going on in crypto at the moment who should you target well value is in the eye of the beholder if you give someone who's got 30 choices to create a bank account and you say, oh, no, 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 but it, like, try it. It's awesome because it's, it's crypto or it's Bitcoin. It's like, uh, whatever, dude. Like the switching costs are not worth it, basically. Mm-hmm. I don't give a shit enough because there's not enough value to me to switch. Now, if you go to someone in, uh, let's say, Argentina or, you know, Africa, hey, you're not going to suffer f- like 15, 20% in- inflation. You will break even at the end of the year. If you had $100 this year, you will have $100 or $99.50 at the end of, the end of the year mm-hmm. argentina if you bought bitcoin at the top of the bull run 20k and you sold it at the bottom when it's 3800 or whatever you did uh it was better to have done that than to hold the argentinian peso of course yeah i you're smart i'm not i didn't know that i, I was like holy I, shit I, I, the only reason why i know that is because i have people tweeting at me all the time right w- okay which currencies are failing and yeah <laughs> and this isn't this isn't venezuela this isn't you know this is it's getting close to home and it will start like oh it's gonna happen in the u.s hyper hyperinflation is gonna happen in the yeah, u.s absolutely. they're already hedging yep. uh they got their interest rate you know manipulations going qe's raging on and uh I, th- I think I remember if it was the U.S. or uh, the ECB recently that mm. started to hint at the idea of like, oh, we may actually allow inflation to go over the targets, but like that's okay because we're planning on it. Blah, 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 <laughs> blah, blah. God almighty. I'll tell you what, though. Like if you look at the – like there are different tiers, right? So, you know, you're in the investment side. You look at the individuals that have gotten into crypto earlier and Bitcoin, and they're, you know, really enthusiastic and thought leaders, and they're rewarded for their enthusiasm – and they're rewarded uh, longer term with financially when they there was no incentive at the time to buy it. Um, they were there on principle. And then you look at banks like, say, Silvergate Bank. Silvergate Bank is a fantastic case study, if, in my opinion. Um, you know, we've uh, like just obviously we're a crypto company and they specialized in saying, hey, we're not going to dismiss it. We're going to focus it. We're going to double down and take a look at it, because if there is something here, then we should be serving it. And they're going they're getting rewarded for their investment and in time now. And. The next layer on, you talk about like, you know, oh, institutional money's coming in, da, da, da. And there's this whole narrative people are just sort of frothing at the mouth over. Look, they'll get here eventually. Just make sure you are in beforehand, basically, because after them, then the next one is going to be governments. And there's obviously already governments that do hold Bitcoin and there's governments that don't. And those that hold Bitcoin early are going to be rewarded for that investment, uh, whether that's a hedge or a desperation. Um, it doesn't matter. It we'll all come full circle and you'll find that damn i wish i could rewind time and there's no time <laughs> machine unfortunately so yeah i don't know i don't even know what you asked i literally just fire hosed you with trash <laughs> sorry i mate. love it i love it <laughs> all right let, let's do a rapid fire before we uh wrap up here uh most important company in crypto other than wire oh fuck how do you go rapid fire on that oh uh most important company in crypto. Oof. uh sh- Oh man, can we cut this? No. no. Oh fuck. Uh oh, shit. Uh make it out. Why? Uh gateway drug. That is not what I expected you to say. All right, explain. What was I supposed to say? I and that's not a popular answer, so I want to hear why you uh, think I was going to say Blockstream, OpenNode, or Make It Out. And I felt like Make It Out right this second because they are upholding a ton of the Come try crypto. Like they are underpinning are a they lot though? of. Well, are people's first interaction with MakerDAO or with something else? Well, I mean, the first interaction is obviously with most of the time with Bitcoin, but MakerDAO is providing the all the digital money that is getting done by GUSD, USDC, mm-hmm. PAX, and all those guys. I mean, you would say, what are they com- a competitor to a decentralized stablecoin? Uh, yeah, I mean. Well, no, what they're doing is that's a crowdsourced education on ramp. What what does MakerDAO look like ten years from now, and do you think they're still around? I would say MakerDAO 
Yes, I think they're still around. I would okay. say they'd probably I probably be, agree with that. Yeah, I'd say they'd still be around. I think they would have probably migrated a lot of their, uh, you know, firstly, they have a lot of different assets and those different assets would be underpinned by something more secure. So something like Blockstream Liquid, for example, that's collateralized Bitcoin. That is like, it, it, people are going to realize that if it's not the most secure party in town, you're going to want to be on the most secure chain. And I feel like a lot of teams may end up migrating. Maybe not. I this don't know. This is my anything. surprise trend of 2020, calling it now. I've been calling it for a few weeks now. Mm -hmm. DeFi merges with Bitcoin, and it ends up all getting built around uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I don't disagree with that. Um, I don't think nice. I don't know if it's strange. I mean, uh, like for yeah, us, it may it may take we'll more than twelve months. Help. It, it yeah. may take a little bit more than twelve months to actually like fulfill the promise. But there will be multiple companies that get launched to do this in twenty twenty. Yes, and I definitely think that that's something that uh, we look at a lot, just purely from a security standpoint. If it's you know, if we're looking at the longer term thing, what does it what does it mean to be on Bitcoin? Um, does that mean, oh, you got to build everything on it? No, it just means that the lens of truth is the hardest chain to bullshit, basically. And I think like, that means, you know, if, if I was doing uh, backups uh, and I wanted to prove that I had something, I could put it on chain A, B, C, D, or E. I'd just choose whatever the longest one is and the hardest to bullshit so that someone can't wipe over it later. And that means that I built that proof on bitcoin it doesn't mean that i had to build all the tech and stuff it just means the keys sit on that and the recovery yeah it's like a backup machine basically i think that's fair yeah what's the one regulation Sick rapid fire so <laughs> <laughs> what's the one regulation you would change or improve if you could uh, i think you asked uh, i would say just uh, either wipe uh, investor accreditations or make it relative to people's <laughs> proportionate net wealth everyone's got enough information on how much people earn so you may as well figure it out I'm not going to touch that right now because people already know my thoughts on accreditation. Uh, what are your thoughts on accreditation? <laughs> <laughs> it's changing. The, the, the SEC recognizes and they're going to they're going to add some improvements. But short, uh, long story short is we should go to an education based system yes. uh, where people have to take a test rather than use wealth as a signal for intelligence. Yep. Uh, and my favorite thing is like how many dumb rich people do you know? I'm I looking know at I, one right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. I just dumb poor person. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I, I think that. Um, I think that's you know the biggest thing, and and uh, I've been quite vocal about uh, it's a violation of the American dream. It is uh, discrimination against people based on wealth, um, and I think it's got to change. So. Yeah, I mean, look at the end of the day, if people bark loud enough, like people that work in the government, they're not there just like I mean, sometimes like we've met, we have to meet regulators and stuff, and they're not there like, oh great, how can I make your life miserable? They're like. Yo, I've got a Netflix subscription. I like Spotify too. Yeah, I like to drink beer and I want to go home and watch TV. They're super they're, rational. Like, I, mean, I mean, they're human beings at the end of the day. If you can make their life easier with, you know, it's kind of a, do you go one step forward, one step backwards to go 10 step forwards? Mm -hmm. Or do you just grind against the grain? And yeah. sometimes it's give and take. So, Aliens. Believer, non-believer? Oh, I define alien. You define it. Okay, well, so the little people, the gray gray people or whatever, you know, the little gray people you see in the stereotype. Um, I would say that they're probably human beings on a, like that's an evolved human being, like a chimpanzee meeting a human being. If we went to a planet that was full of chimpanzees, that would be like an alien coming to us. So, Oh, you think that they're way more advanced than we of are? Of course, yeah, they're carbon-based, same thing. They're just evolved, like they're the next iteration. So... Chimpanzees so we don't want to land so in a plane. Yeah, we don't want to come in contact with them. Um, well, I don't know if we do or don't. Or don't, but well, I don't think it's they're more intelligent and more developed, then they have superiority over us, right? Uh, y yes, I would say so. But um, then maybe superiority is not important. It's important to us now, but maybe they don't value that. Like, as in, we we're threatened by superiority, right? You just of say, course. say, and. Maybe that's... It's because we use superiority. Yes, we use superiority, but why do we do that? I mean, like, you know, we impose our will because we all have our agenda because we have to operate on our self-interest mm -hmm. and not 
what we can do to add value to the collective group. Mm -hmm. So if we're always operating on self-interest, it is a kill or be killed. It's nature is metal. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a, who is the apex predator. And it sounds like the alien coming down from a spaceship or a little green man or whatever it is, is your apex predator. Crocodile, saltwater crocodile. Shout outs to Louis for this one, but saltwater crocodile versus a great white shark. That's the apex battle, of, I'd say. They haven't salt, evolved since salt, like Jurassic. White. Salt. <laughs> Sorry, so, salt water crocodile okay. versus grey white shark. Who wins? It's like a, no. It's, who wins? Uh, I'm convinced now. The salt water crocodile takes the cake. Really? Yeah. I went swimming with great white sharks. It was fucked. It was amazing. You just got to punch them in the nose, right? Oh, mate, have you seen these things? No. You are second. You are the number two person. Like in the food chain, the moment you see these, you will never feel anything more primal instinctively like I am number two food chain. Like just really? immediately. They swim at 40 knots an hour. Let's at 40 miles an hour underwater. These things are big, thick. Like they're like a submarine, um, but they're agile. They're fast. And yeah, there's a reason they haven't evolved for, you know, 350 million years yeah, or whatever. Because what they're doing is working. <laughs> Dude, yeah, it's doing just fine. What, yeah. what, uh, what's the most important book you've ever read? Oh, I'm a terrible reader. I can't read really. Really? Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. I can't comprehend properly. I've, I'm really bad at comprehending. So uh -huh. I have to, anything I read, I have to read 20 times. Like, that's, yeah. le that's less times than uh, reading Naval's tweets 30 times. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah, <laughs> he's like the, yeah, the final boss in terms of comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to wrap up, I always let uh, the guests ask me one question. What you got for me? How much do you make after tax? joking <laughs> you should have seen it. it was a joke yeah but you seen Step Brothers. um that's what they think uh i want to say what's the most important thing for you that uh what's the one thing you're grateful for for 2019 and what is one thing that you would love to see for yourself as a person for 2020 What's important, um, to, what's important to Well, pop? 2019 is super easy. Uh, as oh, pretty much everyone knows, uh, I got engaged. So, uh, so Polina takes the cake on that one. Nice. Um, and uh, in 2020, uh, it's funny we talked about time earlier. I have uh, I've become much more ruthless with protecting my time. Um, I uh, I made a promise to, uh, to to Joe, who's smirking over in the corner. Uh, and Polina that I was going to travel a lot less in 2020. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've just been um, saying no to a lot of things, a lot of these conferences, et cetera. No. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll still have to travel a little bit. But uh, I think this year um, I, sh I should look it up. Uh, I think I took more than 140 flights. This You're year. a busy dude. Um, right? 140 <laughs> flights. Like if you start doing the math on that. That's more than one every three days. It's that's insane. <laughs> it sounds like you play for a baseball team right. or something. Yeah. So no, like, no. By the way, no discipline is a modern day superpower. When everything like no is I. So I suck at saying no. That's literally yeah. what I'm getting. I used to suck. I'm much better at it now. No, no, you're not. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, but yeah, um, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, man. Listen, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, super excited about what you guys are building. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people across the uh, the industry are starting to realize that the uh, the infrastructure is necessary, <laughs> and uh, and it's quite difficult to do on their own. So uh, they are uh, they're coming to you guys. So thanks so much for the work. I appreciate you, you having me. Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, Pump.